I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Oh, hello, and welcome to the Leaves of Glen Mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording in my basement. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. This week, I'm going to start reading Winnie the Pooh by A.A. Milne. 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 When I was a kid, I used to think it was malign. I tried to read Winnie the Pooh as a child, and I, it was the most boring thing I ever read in my entire life. Why do I want to read it as an adult? Because I want those clicks. So, uh, I, so I, as a kid, thought it was malign. Why? Because I'm one of those people that I see a word, I see the first letter, I see the last letter, I see a jumble of crap in the middle, and then I think, I got it all figured out. So for the longest time, it's AA malign. Uh, so if you hear me say that at some point in the next couple episodes, it's just because my childhood, I was neglected. Uh, and also the fact that I thought Winnie the Pooh was so boring is, is weird because I'm a kid that actually read a book called Flat Tail. Well, my dad read it to me. It's a book called Flat Tail, and I loved it. It was about a beaver, a beaver just existing. He didn't really have like any conflicts or anything big happen. Uh, he just sort of made his dam and he had his family and that was it. My dad read it to me and oh god I loved it. Uh, and then as an adult I wound up finding a copy of it because I wanted to give it to my dad as a gift and then I, I read it again and I still liked it even though it has nothing going on for it whatsoever. But for some reason I thought Winnie the Pooh was the most boring thing in the world. You want to learn about the author? Sure. A.A. A. Milne was born January 18th, 1882, and he died January 31st, uh, 1956. Oh, yeah, good stretch. Uh, Alan Alexander Ma Ma Maline was an English writer best known for his books about the teddy bear, Winnie the Pooh, who, uh, as well as for the children's poetry. Oh, uh, Milne was uh, primarily a playwright before the huge success of Winnie the Pooh overshadowed all his previous work. Maline, Milne, Milne, served in both world wars as a lieutenant in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. It, why can I say Warwickshire, but I can't say Mil Milne? In the First World War as a captain and in, in, in the Home Guard in the Second World War. Milne, I'm deciding that's how it's pronounced, was the father of bookseller Christopher Robin Milne, upon which the character Christopher Robin is based. It is during a visit to London Zoo where Christopher became enamored with the tame and amiable bear Winnipeg. That Malney Milne was inspired to write the story of Winnie the Pooh for his son. Uh, you want to learn some fun facts about the author? Sure, of course everyone does, and it also fills up the time for the big grandfather clock goes off and tells me when to shut up and start reading the book. A.A. Uh, a. Milne had a famous school teacher. Yeah, his father, John, ran a small boys' school, Hanley House, and one of the teachers he employed was a young H.G. Wells. Wells was a few years away from publishing his first novel, The Time Machine, when he had a uh, post at Henley House in 1889 and uh, 1890 and taught Milne mathematics. It obviously rubbed off. It was a subject Milne read at Cambridge. Two, uh, he wrote a very prescient play about Christopher Robin. Period. Almost. Period. Before the success of Winnie the Pooh at all, uh, and indeed before Christopher Robin was born, Milne was a very successful playwright. One of his early plays was The Great Broxop. Oh, Lord. About the resentment a child felt against his father who used his name and image in a popular advertisement. The same resentment Christopher Milne would later feel about being Christopher Robin. Is, uh, he was famous for his pacifism, despite or because of fighting World War I. Milne was a noted pacifist in the 1930s. And 
Peace with Honor was widely read in 1934. However, it was followed up in 1840 by War with Honor. If anyone reads Peace with Honor now, he must read it with one word. Hitler scrawled across every page. No, he's a pretty nice. He seems like a nice guy. I'm scared that the every episode, the more I learn about this man, he's going to wind up having something horrible uh, going on for him. Like the jackass pedophile murderer uh, who wrote Peter Pan. Oh, well, that was nice. He had a couple literary feuds, and he unknowingly caused the Latin bestseller. Well, we're not going to learn about that. We're going to go dive into the story of Winnie the Pooh. Ah, well, there you go. Get yourself seated here in the library, not my basement, of the Nuzzle House Mansion. As we start to read Chapter 1 of Winnie the Pooh, in which we are introduced to Winnie the Pooh and some bees and the stories begin. That's quite the title. Here is Edward Bear coming up downstairs now, bump, bump, bump. On the back of his head, behind Christopher Robin, it is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. Uh, but sometimes he feels that there is really another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment, yeah, and think of it. Uh, and then he feels that perhaps there isn't. Anyhow, here he is at the bottom and ready to be introduced to you, Winnie the Pooh. When I first heard his name, I said, ah, just as you were going to say, but I thought he was a boy. So did I, said Christopher Robin. Then you can't call him Winnie? I don't. But you said he's Winnie the Pooh. Don't you know that, that what there means? Ah, yes, I do, I said quickly, and I hope you do too, because it is all the explanation you're going to get. Sometimes Winnie the Pooh likes a game of some sort when he comes downstairs, and sometimes he likes to sit quietly in front of the fire and just, uh, I don't know, listen to a story. This evening, what about a story, said Christopher Robin. Hey. What about a story, I said. But could you very sweetly tell Winnie the Pooh one? I suppose so, I said. Uh, what sort of story does he like? Well, about himself, because he's that sort of bear. Uh, I see. So you could, you, could you very sweetly? I'll try, I said. So I tried. Once upon a time, a very long time ago now, about last Friday, Winnie the Pooh lived in a forest all by himself under the name of uh, <coughs> Sanders. <laughs> uh, oh, this is in italics. I didn't know if I was supposed to read it. There's a little illustration of Winnie the Pooh sitting uh, outside of some kind of little hut or cave or something. It just says Sanders over the door. And he's got a little fire going. And then parentheses and italics goes, What does under the name mean? asked Christopher Robin. It means he had... Oh, I guess this is their conversation outside the story. Uh, it means he had a name over the door in gold letters and he lived under it. Well, Winnie the Pooh wasn't quite sure, said Christopher Robin. Now I am, uh, said a growly voice. Uh, then I will go on, said I. One day he was out walking and he came at, uh, to an open place in the middle of the forest. And in the middle of this place, there was a large oak tree. And from the top of the tree, there came a, there came a, uh, <coughs> a loud buzzing noise. And Winnie the Pooh sat down at the foot of the tree and uh, put his head between his paws and began to think. First of all, he said to himself, that buzzing noise... Uh, it means something. You don't get a buzzing noise like that, just buzzing and buzzing, without its uh, meaning something. If there's, a, if there's a, a buzzing noise, someone's making a buzzing noise. And the only reason for making a buzzing noise that I know of is because you're a bee. Then he thought another long time and said, And the only reason for uh, being a bee that I know is of making honey. Then he got up and said, And the only reason for making honey is so as I can eat it. <laughs> so he began to climb the tree. Oh, he climbed and he climbed and he climbed. And as he climbed, oh, he sang a little song to himself. Hey, it went like this. Ugh, I hate it when stories have songs in them. Ba bump 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 Isn't it funny how a bear likes honey? Buzz, buzz, buzz. I wonder why he does. Then he climbed a little further, and a little further, and then just a little further. And by the time he thought of another song, it was a very funny thought that if bears were bees, yeah, yeah. Oh, they build their nests at the bottom of trees, yeah, yeah, because they're because they're big. And then being so, if bees were bears, oh, we shouldn't have to climb up all these stairs. 
Oh, that was supposed to be a song. Well, I'm not singing that. Uh, he was getting rather tired by this time, and so uh, that is why he, he sang a complaining song. Uh, he was nearly there now, and if he just stood on that branch, crack. Oh, help, said Pooh, as he dropped ten feet to the branch below him. If only I hadn't, he said, as he bounced twenty feet onto the next branch. Ah, uh, you see, what I meant to do, he explained, as he turned head over heels and, and crashed onto another branch thirty feet below. What I meant to do, of course, it was rather, he admitted, as he slithered very quickly through the next six branches. It all comes, I suppose, he decided, as he said goodbye to the last branch, spun around three times, and flew gracefully into a gorse bush. What's a gorse bush? Well, thank God I've got the Kindle. Let's see what it says. Uh, it's commonly known as gorse, furs, or wind. It's a genus of flowering plants in the family of Fabaceae. I can't pronounce that. The genus comprise. I'm not going to look up Fabaceae. I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole of looking up words and how to pronounce them. The genus comprises about 20 species of thorny evergreen shrubs. Hmm? And in the subfamily of Fibidae, of the P family, Fabaceae, all the species are native to parts of Western Europe and Northwest Africa, with the majority of species in Iberia. Well, that was worth making a stop and look that up. It all comes to of liking honey so much. Oh, hell. He crawled out of the gorse bush, brushed the prickles from his nose, and began to think again. And the first person he thought of was Christopher Robin. Oh, what does that mean? said Christopher Robin in an odd voice, hardly daring to believe it. Oh, I, yeah, that was you. Christopher Robin said nothing, but his eyes got larger and larger, and his face got uh, pinker and pinker. So Winnie the Pooh went round to his friend Christopher Robin, who lived behind the green door in another part of the forest. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, Chris Robin, he said. Uh, good morning, Winnie there, Pooh, said you. I wonder if you've got such a thing as a balloon about you. A balloon? Yes, I just said to myself coming along. I wonder if, uh, 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 I wonder if uh, Christopher Robin has such a thing as a balloon about him. And I just said it to myself, thinking of balloons and wondering. Hey, what do you want a balloon for, you said. Winnie the Pooh looked round to see that nobody was listening. He put his paw to his mouth and he said in a deep whisper, Honey. Bet you don't get honey with balloons. I do, said Pooh. Now it just happened that you had been to a party that day in, in the house of your friend Piglet. And you had balloons at the party and you had a big green balloon. And one of Rabbit's relations had had a big blue one and had left it behind, being really too young to go to a party at all. So you had brought the green one and the blue one home with you. Hey, which, uh, uh, which one would you like, you asked Pooh. Well, he put his head between his paws and thought very carefully. Uh, it's like this, he said. When you, when you go after honey with a balloon, uh, the great thing is not to let the bees know you're coming. So, so if, you have a, if you got a green balloon, they might think that you were only part of the tree and not notice you. And if you uh, have a blue balloon, well, they might think you're only part of the sky and not notice you. And the, uh, the question is, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is more likely? Yeah, wouldn't they notice you underneath the balloon, you asked. No, they might, and they might not, said Winnie the Pooh. You never can tell bees. <laughs> he thought for a moment and said, And I shall try to look like a, a small black cloud. Now that will deceive them. Then you had better have the blue balloon, you said. And so it was decided. Well, you both went out with the blue balloon, and you took your gun uh, with you, and just in case, his kid's got a gun, and he always did, and Winnie the Pooh went to a very muddy place that he knew of, and rolled and rolled, he was black all over, and then with the balloon, uh, was blown up as big as big, and, and you and Pooh were both holding on to the string, and you let go suddenly, and Pooh Bear floated gracefully up into the sky and, and, and stayed there, level with the top of the tree for about uh, 20 feet away from it. Uh, uh, hooray, he shouted. Isn't that fine, shouted Winnie the Pooh down to you. Uh, what do I look like? Now you look like a bear holding onto a balloon, you said. Not, said Pooh anxiously, like a, like a small black cloud in the blue sky. Nah, not very much. 
Ah, well, perhaps from up here it looks different. And uh, as I say, you never can tell with bees. <laughs> well, there's no wind to blow him nearer to the tree, so he stayed. And he could see the honey, and he could smell the honey. Oh, he couldn't quite reach the honey. And after a while, he, he called down to you. Uh, uh, Christopher, uh, Christopher Robin, he said in a loud whisper. Uh, hello. I think the bees suspect something. Uh, uh, what sort of thing? Nah, I don't know, but something tells me that they're suspicious. P uh, perhaps they think you're after their honey? Maybe that, but you can never kind of tell with bees. <laughs> there was another little silence, and then he called down to you again. Uh, uh, Christopher Robin? Y yes? You have you an umbrella in your house? I think so. I wish you'd bring it out here and walk up and down with it and look up at me every now and then and say, tut-tut, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 it looks like rain. And I think if you did that, it would help the deception which, which you are practicing on these bees. Well, you laughed to yourself, silly old bear, and you, you didn't say it out loud because you were so fond of him, and you went home for your umbrella. Oh, uh, there you are called down Winnie the Pooh as soon as he got back to the tree. I was beginning to get anxious. I have discovered that the bees are now definitely suspicious. Well, should I put my umbrella up? He said. Eh, yes. Wait a moment. Uh, we must be practical. The important bee to deceive is the queen bee. Yeah, can you see what the queen bee is from down there? No. Oh, a pity. Well, now, if you walk up and down with the umbrella saying, uh, ta-ta, it looks like rain, and I shall do what I can by singing a little cloud song, <laughs> such as a cloud might sing, <clears throat> four dots, go. So, while you walked up and down and wondered if it would rain, Winnie the Pooh sang this song. Do-do-do-do, how sweet to be a cloud floating in the blue. Every little cloud always sings all loud. How sweet to be a cloud floating in the blue. It makes them very proud to be a little cloud. Ah, the bees were still buzzing as suspiciously as ever. Some of them, indeed, left their nests and flew all around the cloud as it began the second verse of his song. There's a second verse. Oh, I just read it. Thank God. No more songs, please. And, uh, and one bee sat down at the nose of the cloud for a moment, and then he got up again. Uh, Christopher, M-dash, ow, exclamation point, M-dash, Robin, called out the cloud. Yes, I've been thinking, and I have come to a very important decision. These are the wrong sorts of bees. Are they? Well, quite the wrong sort, so I should think they would make the wrong sort of honey, shouldn't you? Would they? Yes. Uh, so I think I shall come down. How? asked you. When the Pooh hadn't thought about this. If you let go of the string, you would fall, bump, and he didn't like the idea of that. So, uh, he thought for a long time. I just burped again. I promised I wouldn't do that. And then he said, Christopher Robin... You must shoot the balloon with your gun. Uh, have you got a gun? Oh, of course I have, you said. Uh, but I do that. Uh, it'll, it'll spoil the balloon, you said. Well, if you don't, said Pooh, I shall have to let go, and that would spoil me. Well, the physics of this doesn't make any sense. If he lets go, he falls down and crashes. If you shoot the balloon, he falls down and he crashes. He doesn't have a gentle descent at any point in one of these two options. Uh, when he puts it like this, oh, you saw how it was, and you aim very carefully with his actual gun at the balloon and fired. Ow, said Pooh. Did I miss? You asked. They didn't exactly miss, said Pooh, but you missed the balloon. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, you said, and you fired again. This time you hit the balloon, and the air came slowly out. How? It's a gun. Uh, and Winnie the Pooh floated down to the ground. Ah, but his arms were so stiff from holding to the string of the balloon that all the time that they stayed straight up in the air for more than a week, and whenever a fly came and settled on his nose, he had to blow it off. And I think, but I am not sure, uh, that that is why he was always called Pooh. Is that the end of the story? Yes, Christopher Robin. Well, that's the end of that one. Uh, there are others. About Pooh and me? And Piglet and Rabbit and all of you. Don't you remember? Well, I do remember, and that's why I try to remember. I forget. Well, that day when Pooh and Piglet tried to catch the heffalump, uh, they didn't catch it, did they? No. Pooh couldn't because he hasn't any brain. Did I catch it? Well, that comes to the story. Christopher Robin nodded. Oh, I do remember, he said. Only Pooh doesn't very well, and that's why he likes having it told to him again. Because then it's a real story and not remembering. Well, that's just how I feel, I said. Christopher Robin gave a deep sigh. P 
picked up his bear by the leg, and walked off to the door, trailing Pooh behind him. And at that door, he turned and said, uh, "'Coming to see me have my bath?' weird. I might, I said. It didn't hurt him when I shot him, did it? Well, no, not a bit. And he nodded, went out, and in a moment I heard Winnie the Pooh, bump, 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 going up the stairs behind him. This story, though that chapter's over, reminds me that, um, there's other options. Do you want to get uh, at the honey of a, of a beehive? Well, sure, you could do it. You could wear the fancy suit. Uh, you could also just be a bee farmer where you just have a bunch of bees in those boxes. Uh, you keep blowing smoke on them for God knows what reason. And then you, uh, and you get all that honey. Oh, that honey's delicious. You just like, scoop it all up because all that honey is just poop poop that bees make. It just, oh God, we love it. For some reason, we can't eat other poop. Horse poops, we don't want to have that. But when a bee poops, oh God, we love it. And so that we, uh, uh, we've learned tricks, but in the case of uh, 1880, whenever, when this was written, uh, maybe 1920s, I don't know whenever he wrote this, uh, he, it, he didn't have options that we have today, like the bee suit and the weird smoke thing they keep doing. Probably. I don't know. Maybe they did. I don't really care. My point is that we have technology now that allows us to take an entire beehive without them ever knowing that we were present. How do you do that? Mirrored glass. Oh, you, you make a tower of mirrored glass on four little wheels. You push this tower up there, and you're in the top of the tower, and you got a little door, like a glass door, and you just sit there. Oh, you can see the tree fine. You can see the beehive just fine. You get up there. You got a friend pushing it down below, or a couple friends, and they push this thing up, and you just sit there, and then you wait till the you wait till the bees all go to the grocery store, and then you just reach the you open up the little door, and you reach it up. Because what do they see? They just see another beehive or whatever. They just see you know reflect of glass. Like, oh, it's just not a beehive. Somebody built a house next to our house. Oh, I, I hate neighbors. It's the reason why we moved out here, because I hate neighbors. Well, now we got a neighbor, so the whole neighborhood's going to crap. So, uh, we're great. And then they all take off. Like, oh, time to go to the grocery store. We gotta go to Target. We gotta get more kitty litter. And so then they take off, and then that's when you just scoop out all that delicious honey. You can do that thanks to people like Stephen Dorglas of DorglasIncorporated.com. It's D-O-R-G-L-A-S-S dot com. Uh, they're dedicated to fabricating and professionally installing the highest quality glass products from the nation's top manufacturers, their inventory combined with their years of experience makes them the premier source for installation and repair. They approach every project with the same goals, professionalism, integrity, and they're discreet. They're discreet when they see some weirdo that doesn't just go buy honey from the grocery store because there's too many bees shopping there. You know, no, he wants to steal from their house because he's some kind of weirdo. And so, no, he'll, he'll do it. Oh, you pay him enough money, he'll make whatever you want him to make and he won't tell the police about a single thing. What do they do? Commercial storefronts, automatic entrances, windows, patio doors, mirrors, shower doors, installation repair, and they'll design and build any bee-related thing that you want. Clients are Pottery Barn, Williams Sonoma, Sherman Williams, Portillo's, which a sandwich place no one cares about, and the Salt Cave, which is a place that has Himalayan salt walls for white people to do the things that white people do, like uh, just stretch a lot for yoga. And then they're like, ooh, wouldn't it be fun if we did yoga, but we turned the temperature up? They turned the temperature up, and they're like, ah, you like that? Just keep coming here. We built this weird cathedral to Himalayan salt walls that are all backlit, so it looks like you're inside some sort of uh, dragons and deserts. Yeah, d- d- here, you want to keep stretching? Go ahead, but it's going to cost you 20 bucks for like a half hour and then you know, white suburban people just love that crap they're like oh yes i gotta make sure i spend hundreds of dollars on my outfit from uh lululemon that's another thing lululemon every time i see lululemon my brain says lululemon apparently this uh poo book is bringing out the worst of my reading abilities um but don't lick the walls or touch them uh and also applebee's Well, with that, why don't we retire upstairs to my master bedroom? It's everything's made of velvet. The ceiling's made of velvet. The floor is made of velvet. The walls are made of crushed velvet, which is kind of a nice little twist. And then in the middle of this giant room is a heart-shaped waterbed, which, yes, is impossible to make, but I had a friend make it for me. And it leaks all the time, and the water stinks because it's rancid, but uh, it's fine. I keep patching it up, and it's still good. We can lay on it while I read to you the latest upcoming romance literature from Penguin Random House Books. Not so fast. Oh, well, you thought you were just going to lay up in my little bed while I read. No, we're reading a children's book. We're not going to go to the master bedroom and do that. Instead, 
I will meet you in the snuggle closet. It's a closet full of pillows where we snuggle. And then I read to you a children's book appropriate romance novels. I'll see you there. I'm in here. I have to open the door I'm in here. Ah, come on in to my luxurious small closet with pillows all inside and a single naked light bulb suspended from the ceiling where we can snuggle appropriately and I can read to you The Promise of Easter. Uh, yeah, I caught you off guard, didn't I? You're wearing that outfit, which I will not talk about out loud because it's inappropriate for such an illustrious children's book for me to talk about what the hell you're wearing. Uh, the Promise of Easter by Marta Perry. Uh, it's part of an Amish holiday novel. Uh, the category is romance and spiritual fiction. Oh, you're so disappointed. Yeah, and I'm sure you feel even more ridiculous in those leathers you're wearing because you were expecting more. About the promise of Easter? Yeah, the promise Glen. Ooh, as promise Glen. Is that a person or is it a place? Either way, I want it. Prepares for the Easter season, one woman discovers that forgiveness is freedom and maybe forever after. Anna Stoltzfus, Stoltzfus, lives in a quiet but fulfilling life in promise Glen. Oh, it's a place. I still want to live there. Though she lost her beloved brother in a tragic accident, her family is supportive and close-knit. And her job as a cherished teacher at the Orchard Hill Amish School fills her heart with joy each day. Anna knows one day she'll find someone she can love and marry. But she's perfectly happy with the life she's created. Anna's comfort is quickly dashed, however, when the man and a deemed responsible for James' death returns to the Amish community. Matthew King. Blech. Forgiveness is at the heart of being Amish. They're kind of a cult. I don't really know if that's what that's at the heart of being Amish. More of it, that they're a cult is at the heart. And then no one else blames Matthew. His grief and pain over losing his dear friend are obvious. Still, no matter how she tries, Anna can't let go of the reckless night that ended her brother's life so soon. What did they do on their reckless night? I heard that the Amish, when they turn 18, they're allowed to go out. Well, I'm not going to talk about that. This is an illustrious children's book episode. Uh, and her brother's life so soon. The acne ache, the ache had been more tolerable. I wish it was acne. The acne had been more tolerable. After Matthew left Promise Glen, but now, not only has he returned, Anna's father accepts his offer to work on their farm. Ugh. As the preparation for Easter begins, Anna's regular contact with Matthew introduces her to a man far different than the boy she knew before. Perhaps the season of solemn reflection and joyous remembrance might be exactly what they both need to find forgiveness for the past and a hopeful future. Well, there you go. That seems fairly appropriate. Uh, the Promise of Easter by Marta Perry. You can get that in a paperback for eight ninety nine and Amazon, Barnes & Noble Books, a million bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, IndieBound, Powell's Target, and Walmart. I can get out of my closet. Let's go back downstairs where I can continue reading to you from this book. Ah, there you are. You're back. Oh, and you look so fussed. Oh, you didn't have all the kind of fun you were expected to have as an adult, but we're reading a children's book, and we need to keep it on the up and up. Ah, if it'll make you feel any better, let's both sit over here by the fireplace and just uh, wiggle our little toes together. Cute, cute, cute. That's the theme of the next God knows how many episodes as I continue reading this book of Winnie the Pooh. Uh, well, when we get into the next chapter. Uh, chapter two, in which Pooh goes visiting and gets into a tight place. Edward Bear, known to his friends as Winnie the Pooh. What, he's got his, his name is Edward Bear? Or Pooh, for short, was walking through the forest one day, humming proudly to himself. He had made up a little hum that very morning, as he was doing the stoutness exercises in front of the glass. tra la la eh. Uh, tra -la -la, as he stretched up as high as he could go. And then, tra-la-la, tra-la-oh, 
Help! La! As he tried to reach his toes. After breakfast, he had said it over and over to himself until he had learnt it off by heart. And now he was humming it right through properly. It went like this. Oh, God. Tra-la-la! 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 <laughs> Tra-la-la! Rum-tum! Tiddle-um-tum! Tiddle-iddle! Tiddle-iddle! tiddle Tiddle-iddle! Rum-tum-tum! Tiddle-um! The dumbest thing I've ever read with my mouth, I think, the entire three years I've been doing this. Well, he was humming his hum to himself and walking along gaily, wondering what everyone else was doing and what it felt like being somebody else, when suddenly he came to a sandy bank, and in that bank was a large hole. Ah, 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 said Pooh. Rum, tum, tiddle, um, tum. If I know anything about anything, that hole means rabbit, he said, and rabbit means Company, he said, and company means food and listening to me humming. <laughs> and such like. Rum tum tum tiddle um. I love that I could have friends in my life that are forced to just sit there and watch me hum. <laughs> so he bent down, put his head onto the hole, and called out, yeah, Is anybody home? And there was a sudden scuffling noise from inside the hole, and then silence. Well, uh, uh, what, I, what I said was, <clears throat> Is anybody at home? called out Pooh very loudly. No, said a voice. Then he added, You needn't shout so loud. I I heard you quite well the first time. Oh, brother, said Pooh. Isn't there anybody there at all? Nobody. Winnie the Pooh took his little head out of the hole and thought for a little, and then he thought to himself, Oh, there must be somebody in there, because somebody must have said nobody. He put his head back into the hole and said, "Uh, Hello, Rabbit. Is Is that you? No, said Rabbit in a different sort of voice this time. Uh, But isn't that Rabbit's voice? I don't think so, said Rabbit. It isn't meant to be. No, said Pooh. And he took his head out of the hole, and he had another think, and then he put it back, and he said, Well, yeah. well you, could you very kindly tell me where Rabbit is? And he had gone to see his friend Pooh, uh, Pooh Bear, who is a great friend of his. Ah, but this is me, said Bear, very much surprised. Uh, what sort of me? Hey, Pooh Bear. Are you sure, said Rabbit, still more surprised. Uh, quite, quite sure, said Pooh. Oh, well, then, come in. So pushed and pushed, uh, Pooh pushed and pushed, and pushed his way through the hole, and at last he got in. Now you're quite right, said Rabbit, looking at him all over. It is you. Glad to see you. Oh, good. He's glad to hear him hum again. Uh, who did you, you think it was? Well, I wasn't sure. Uh, you know how it is in the forest. You, you can't have anybody coming into one's house. One has to be careful. What about a, uh, what about a mouthful of something? Well, Pooh always liked a little something at 11 o'clock in the morning, and he was very glad to see Rabbit getting out of the plates and bugs. And when Rabbit said, uh, honey, or condensed milk with your brick, condensed milk, he was so excited that he said, both. And then, uh, so as not to seem greedy, he added, but, but don't bother about the bread, please. Uh, for as long as time as after that, he said nothing. And then until last, humming to himself, rather sticky voice, he got up, shook Rabbit lovingly by the paw, and said that he must be going on. Oh, yeah, must you, said Rabbit politely. Well, said Pooh, I could stay a little longer if, uh, if, uh, if you, uh, and he tried very hard to look in the direction of the larder. As a matter of fact, said Rabbit, I was just going out myself directly. Oh, well, then, I'll be going on. Uh, goodbye. Well, goodbye, if you're sure you won't have any more. Is, is there any more? Asked Pooh quickly. Rabbit took the covers off the dishes and said, no, there wasn't. I thought not, said Pooh, nodding to himself. Well, goodbye, I must be going on. So he uh, started to climb out of the hole, and he pulled with his front paws and pushed with his back paws. And, and, and a little was his nose was out in the open again, but and, and his ears, and then his front paws, and then his shoulders, and then, oh, oh, help, said Pooh. I'd better go back. Oh, bother, said Pooh. I shall have to go on. I can't do either, said Pooh, or help and bother. Now, by this time, Rabbit wanted to go for a walk, too, and finding that the front door full, he went out by the back door and came around to Pooh and uh, looked at him. Hello, are you stuck? he asked. N- no, said Pooh carelessly, just resting and thinking and humming to myself. Here, give us a paw. Pooh stretched out his paw, and Rabbit pulled and pulled. Ow, cried Pooh, you're hurting. Well, the fact is, said Rabbit, you're stuck. 
It all comes, said Pooh crossly, if not having the front door is big enough. It all comes, said Rabbit sternly, of eating too much. I thought at that, I thought at the time, said Rabbit, only I didn't like to say anything, said Rabbit, that one of us was eating too much, said Rabbit, and I knew that if it wasn't me, he said, well, well, I shall go and fetch Christopher Robin. It's dawning on me that the only way for Pooh to get out of this situation is that all the food that's inside him has to come out. I'll lead you to come to those conclusions. Uh, Christopher Robin lived at the other end of the forest, and when he came back with Rabbit, he saw the front half of Pooh and said, I a silly old bear in such a loving voice that everyone felt quite hopeful again. Well, I just began to think, said Bear, sniffing slightly, that Rabbit might never be able to use his front door again, and I should hate that, he said. Nah, so should I, said Rabbit. Well, use front door again, said Christopher Robinson. Uh, Robinson, Robin. Of course he'll use his front door again. Good, said Rabbit. If we can't pull you out, Pooh, we must push you back. Rabbit scratched at his whiskers thoughtfully and pointed out that uh, when once Pooh was pushed back, he was back. And, of course, nobody was more glad to see Pooh than he was. Still, there it was. Some lived in trees and some lived in underground and, um... You mean I'd never get out, said Pooh? I mean, said Rabbit, that having got so far, it seems a pity to waste it. Christopher Robin nodded. And then there was only one thing to be done, he said. We shall have to wait for you to get thin again. Now, how long, uh, how long does it take getting uh, thin, asked Pooh anxiously. Well, about, ooh, about a week, I should think. I, I can't stay here for a week. You can stay here, all right, silly old bear. It's uh, going to get you out, which is difficult. Well, read to you, uh, said Rabbit cheerfully, and I hope it won't snow, he added. And I say, old fellow, you're taking up a good deal of room in my house. Do you mind if I use your back legs as a towel horse? Because, I mean, there are doing nothing, and it uh, would be very convenient to just hang towels on them. A week, said Pooh gloomily. What about the... Uh, "'What about meals?' "'Well, I'm afraid no meals,' said Christopher Robin, "'because of getting thin quicker. "'But we will read to you.' "'Bear began to sigh. "'Then he found he couldn't because he was so tightly stuck, "'and the bear rolled down his eye and he said, uh, "'When you read a, a sustaining book "'such as would help to comfort a wedged bear "'in such great tightness.' Uh, so for a week, Christopher Robin read that sort of book at the north end of the poo, and Rabbit hung his washing on the south end, and in between, Bear felt himself getting slender and uh, slender. And, uh, and at the end of the week, Christopher Robin said, Now! So he took Pooh, uh, a, a hold of him by his front paws, and Rabbit took hold of his Christopher Robin, and uh, Rabbit friends, and the relations, they all took hold of Rabbit, and they all pulled together. Oh, so there's just other people here they're not explaining. Oh, there's even a hedgehog in there, this little picture, and a mouse, and I think a spider. And for a long time, Pooh only said, ow, and oh. Then all of a sudden, he said, pop, just like a cork coming out of a bottle. And Christopher Robin and Rabbit and all Rabbit's friends and relations went head over heels backwards. And on top of them came Winnie the Pooh, <clears throat> M-Dash, Free! Exclamation point. So, with a nod of thanks to his friends, he went on with his walk through the forest, humming proudly to himself. But Christopher Robin looked after him lovingly and said to himself, Eh, uh, silly old bear. Well, that's the end of that chapter. Why don't we, uh, retire down to the, uh, smoking room where we can review what we read. Well, there you are. Uh, why don't you take a seat as I light this pipe for you? And uh, I'm still going to run with the bit. I know. I, it's, uh, I should move on to something, a new bit, but I got nothing. Um, what's, uh, what happened? How do we take this children's story and apply it to the struggles of modern man? Uh, who wants honey? And uh, he decides to create a, a fake illusion that he's a cloud in the sky to try and get at the honey. And it, uh, nothing works out. you think the bees would swarm him and attack him and everything. Uh, but no, uh, he just sort of floats there for a while and says, shoot me down. And they shoot him down. I don't think the author knows how guns work. If you're going to use a gun, uh, then it, obviously the balloon's just going to explode. But, uh, but, um... So he, he comes down and that's kind of the end of the story. So how do we apply that? To the modern struggles of a of a human condition, uh, just uh, greed 
But then nothing exciting happens, so there's no lesson learned. So I guess he'll just be greedy again. Next story, he goes to visit his friend Rabbit, who uh, has created a hole, and Rabbit doesn't want to talk to anyone except Pooh. So that was weird. I guess uh, what we learned from that is that there's paranoid people in the world. Uh, he lives in the woods, he lives in a hole, but he's still paranoid that uh, strangers are going to come knocking on his door. And what, rob him? Rob him of what? Things in his hole? So uh, Winnie the Pooh uh, comes down there and he slides down the hole. If you're going to have guests like Winnie the Pooh, make a bigger hole. Or why don't you go outside and meet him? Uh, you can have a little picnic outside or something. I don't know. And then uh, so Winnie the Pooh comes down. And of course, you got to know your friend. Uh, is kind of an idiot because uh, most of the time when he comes over, he just sits in a chair, and looks you dead in the eye, and hums. And he expects you to sit and listen to him hum. And don't interrupt him, just let him hum. It could go on for 15, 20 minutes or a half hour, doesn't matter. But then when he's done, you're like, oh, what a good friend. So if this guy comes in and he wants food, clearly he's going to eat all your food because he's uh, not a very good friend. I don't know. Do you ever get food from him? If he got that honey, would you ever get some of that honey? Probably not. He wouldn't share it with you because he's greedy. So then uh, Winnie the Pooh eats too much and he gets too big and then he can't get out. Of course, the, the basic understanding of how a human body works, the way to get thinner means things need to come out. You can't just hold on to all that stuff. But he stayed there for a week as they read to him and apparently nothing came out of his body, which is uh, good for Rabbit. That's for sure, because I'd hate to think what his, his hole would look like if Pooh operated like the rest of us do. Uh, and then uh, then they all pulled him out. All of a sudden, there's all sorts of magical little creatures. There's a hedgehog, there's like a spider, there's like a little rabbit, a mouse, whatever. They're all pulling on Christopher Robin as they pull him out of the hole. And then he pops out. Did he learn anything? Probably not. How do we apply this to uh, people in the modern age? I just There's... Simple idiots. We got simple idiots. We live in a world with a lot of simple idiots, so I guess he's just one of them. I've never had anyone hum to me before, but uh, I'm sure it's going to happen someday. Well, that was interesting. I'm glad I'm doing this. Uh, so with that, why don't we uh, just end this episode, and I will see you uh, on the next one. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, nah, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. You can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, including stuff like gestating the curious mind with my lady friend and also a, a little side project I'm going to be doing with my daughter. Oh, I'm on Instagram, but no one uses that anymore because they all use TikTok. Am I ever going to get on TikTok? No. But if you want to look at my dead Instagram, it's at uh, House Nuzzle. I also have Twitter, which I use the most, which is also conveniently at House Nuzzle. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.Nuzzles at gmail.com. But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left.